I'm going to read a passage from the book I have coming out this January. It's, uh, it's called Night at the Shore. I thought about calling it a bad night at the shore, but I figured that would be, you know, obvious after people read a few pages. And, and I don't like adjectives, so... You know. uh, so it's a night at the shore. And uh, the narrator's being, he's on a, he's trapped on a barrier island at the Jersey Shore and he's being pursued by bad people. And it's about the middle of the book. I was about to pitch the phone when it occurred to me that I might have a way to improve my chances, maybe even end this nonsense entirely. It might have been my underlying foul mood that gave me this idea, but it felt like a good move. If I was right, I'd have to work quickly. A house on the next corner was dark on all three floors. I banged on the door to the first floor apartment, waited a few seconds and kicked it in. I tried the light switch. The power was on. The apartment seemed furnished in a combination of Ikea table and chairs and yard sale sofa. There was a cheap floor lamp in the front corner of the living room. I put Billy's phone on the coffee table, picked up a few cardboard coasters, wedged shut, wedged shut the front door, and pulled on it as a test. It held well enough in the ruined door frame. The floor lamp's cord was long. I pitched the shade, set the lamp in front of the door, and switched it on. In the kitchen, I turned the stove knobs full open, past the clicking cord sliders. Unlit gas hissed from the burners. The odor followed me out the back door as I pulled it shut, locking it. I ran through the walkway to the front, across the street, between two homes, and stood behind those on the far side of the block. I waited. I was beginning to think I'd figured this wrong when a black Chrysler pulled up in front of the house I'd read. I'd been right. Luff's crew had trackers on their phones. They followed Billy's here. Four men got out of the car. I was too far away to see if Luff was with them, but I hoped he was. If he was putting up the money to find me, this pursuit might end here. Two crept into the walkway toward the rear, pistols in hand. The men out front waited for them to get into place, and one tried to open the front door with his free hand. He pushed a couple times, but it was too tightly wedged shut. He stepped back, kicked the door just below the knob, and flew over. For a moment, it seemed only that someone had turned on all the lights at once, but then the concussion blew out the walls with a deep-sounding crump that I felt through the soles of my shoes, followed by a clatter of falling degree that lasted Debris that lasted longer than seemed reasonable. A huge fireball rolled and twisted its way up through the storm and was gone, leaving flames coming from the settling debris. The Chrysler was resting on its roof. Cautiously, I went toward it all. The three story house had been reduced to a one story high pile of burning rubble. At its top, a fiberglass tub enclosure, supported only by its supply and drain pipes, swayed in the wind. The house next door was ablaze and appeared to be heavily damaged as well. Debris littered the intersection. Shards of broken glass sparkled like thousands of tiny diamonds, reflecting the flames. There was movement down the street. A man was trying to stand or at least crawl. He must have been blown clear. Blown clear. That's easy for me to say. <laughs> I ran through the rain and pushed him over onto his back to search him for a gun. His clothes were padded. I checked his ankles for a holster. His bare feet were scorched. He'd been blown out of his shoes. He kept trying to say something as I frisked him. I couldn't find anything useful. The weapon he'd carried when the house blew must have been all he'd had. As I took his wallet, he grabbed my wrist with his blackened fingers. Through what was left of his mouth, I heard him croak out, How do I look? The man was dead. He just didn't know it yet. Sirens sounded in the distance. I shook free of the script and took off down the street. So this is a good time, uh, we have two more stories for you, to remind you that all these people are writers, and that's a skill that's hard to own. For them to come up to a microphone and then speak this, read their story, is even harder because most of us, when we come up, are edited, right? <laughs> we come, come on, I wouldn't have said that. What, what was I thinking when I wrote that? I mean, <laughs> take, let's take out that whole paragraph. So it's, it's a different skill set. 
and we appreciate your sitting through us as we learn that skill set to be as good as we are at writing. Chris Corembo is an award-winning award former news reporter. Chris knows quite a bit about crimes and the people who commit them. Chris has served as a speechwriter, a ghostwriter for corporate executives, and recently published her first novel, Killer Deals. 